الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Respected elders, brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last night we spoke in detail about the challenges that Bani Israel faced immediately after crossing the Red Sea. We mentioned that the narrations state that there were about 700,000 people who participated in the Exodus. Now when you have that many people crossing the Red Sea, leaving a place that they recognize as their home, a place that they spent generations living in. They now enter into the Sinai Desert with nothing but the clothes on their back. The first difficulty that they confront is they are now under the intense rays of the sun. The second difficulty is the scarcity of water. They're in the middle of the desert. And it's a very difficult task to find water, let alone distribute water efficiently to 700,000 people. And in addition to the lack of water, there's also a lack of food. These are the three main challenges that they faced. The scarcity, there's no shade for them to protect themselves against the dangerous rays of the sun, the UV rays of the sun, the lack of water, and the lack of food. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He mentions that all of these problems were resolved. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with respect to the the rays of the sun, the intense heat, Allah says, وَظَلَّلْنَا عَلَيْكُمُ الْغَمَامِ We sent a cloud to provide you with shade. With respect to the water, they turned to Musa and they said to him that, O oh Musa, we're thirsty. We need you to provide us with water. And this is where you see them turning to Musa salam. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ مُوسَىٰ إِذْ اسْتَسْقَاهُ قَوْمُ These people are now begging Musa for water. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to him, take your staff and strike the stone. When you strike the stone, it seems that they found a large boulder, you strike the stone and 12 springs will gush from this stone. And through inspiration, he organized these 700,000 into 12 tribes. Each tribe represented one of the descendants of Ya'qub. So the water was provided. And as they would travel, they would take this stone with them. And whenever it was time to provide water, Musa would take his staff and he would strike it, and the springs would gush. As for the food, the Qur'an tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided them with men and salwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alludes to this. In Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 57, وَأَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَنَّ وَالسَّلْوَىٰ كُلُوا مِن طَيِّبَاتِ مَا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ and we sent down for you men and salwa. And we mentioned that some of the Quranic commentators believe that men is a honey-like substance 
that would appear as a type of dew on the plants, the harsh plants in the desert. It was a honey-like substance, and this basically was their breakfast. It provided them with enough nourishment, it satiated them for their morning meal. And salwa is a reference to, as some, many Mufassirin believe, it's a reference to the quails, the birds that they would easily capture. Because some quails are migratory, so many of them, they, it seems like they migrated across North Africa, and as they were traveling through the Sinai Desert, they were tired. They were many of these, so these convoys of birds were exhausted, and because of their exhaustion, they were unable to escape. They were unable to fly. And therefore, the Israelites, they would pick up these quails, and they would eat these birds. So every day, this food was provided to Bani Israel. And really, it's miraculous that 700,000 people in the middle of a desert, Allah provides them all with shade, provides them with sufficient water, and He provides them with two meals a day without them having to exert any effort. Allah provides all of this for them. A great ni'mah that they're experiencing. And now Allah expects nothing from them. Allah doesn't expect them to work or to toil. He just wants them now to focus on worship, to focus on their spirituality. So now that Bani Israel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had granted them everything that they've wanted. For many years they've been praying to Allah to release them from the captivity of Fir'aun. Allah answered their dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided them with everything that they need. Now how did they respond to this ni'mah? The ni'mah of being rescued from tyranny. The ni'mah of being provided with food without having to exert any effort or energy. They now have community. It's not like they're in solitary confinement. They have the ni'mah of community. They have the ni'mah of having a spiritual guide like Musa. They have the ni'mah of physical nourishment. They have the ni'mah of freedom now. They're no longer slaves. How do they respond to this ni'mah? They respond to it with ingratitude. And this is where there is a lesson for you and I. Because this, Allah is not just telling us about something that happened in the past. You and I, we enjoy many blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we respond to these blessings? Many of us were heedless. If we're not ungrateful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, He gives us a rule of thumb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ibrahim, Surah 14, Ayah number 7, He says, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ Allah, your Lord, has an announcement. You know from the word adhan, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ Allah has an announcement for us. You know, when any king or emperor has an announcement, you know, the citizens, the subjects, they, they give their undivided attention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the heavens and the earth, has an announcement for us. What is this announcement? وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ The announcement, the divine proclamation for you and I to hear is what? A simple rule of thumb. A simple guiding principle in your life. If you are grateful, Allah will increase you in His blessings. Notice that Allah doesn't say, if you're grateful, I won't take away your ni'mah. No. It's not that being, being grateful secures the ni'mah. That would have been very gracious of Allah. For Him to say, if you're grateful, you will secure what I have given you. But rather, Allah says, if you are grateful, I will increase. It's not that you will just preserve what you have. You will receive an increase. Now, the, the Old Testament, 
mentions a detail that is not found in the Qur'an. And we mentioned that when you compare the Qur'anic narrative with the biblical narrative, sometimes you will see information in the Qur'an that's not found in the Old Testament, and vice versa. There are some cases where you will find details mentioned in the Old Testament that are not mentioned in the Qur'an. In the book of Exodus, in chapter 16 of Exodus, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will cause food to fall from the sky. This could be a reference to the quails, that these birds are flying and they descend, they land because they're too tired to fly anymore. And the Israelites, they would capture these birds. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will create, I will cause food to fall from the sky. This food will be for you to eat. And then the Old Testament continues, every day the people should go out and gather the food they need that day. I will do this to see if they will do what I tell them. So Allah is telling Musa that tell Bani Israel that I will provide men and salwa to them and I only have one condition. The condition is every day the people will gather only enough food for one day. Don't hoard. Don't be greedy. Don't take more than you need. Take what you need for that day. This was the only request. Do not hoard. And subhanAllah, we saw how human beings, they have this tendency to hoard when there's this fear of scarcity. Right? We saw during the early stages of the pandemic, what happened? You see a society that claims to be civilized and a superpower, all of a sudden, everyone was hoarding. Not thinking about those who are less fortunate. Everybody was thinking about themselves. So the Old Testament mentions this, that only gather what you need for the day. And this shows you that the human being has so much hope and so much confidence that he will remain in this world. You know, this is the attitude that we should have. That sometimes we stress so much about, you know, what am I going to do when I turn 70? Baba, you're 30 years old now. Now, I'm not saying don't plan for the future. Plan, but why do you have so much anxiety about something that you're not even sure you're going to witness? Do your best and leave your... Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the one condition set for them was what? Do not hoard. Gather only what you need. The Old Testament says they disobeyed. They would go and they would gather more than what they need. One of them would see a quail, he'll take two of them. He'll take three of them. Storing away some extra, you know, men, some of the extra honey-like substances. And the Old Testament says that much of the food was spoiled because of how much they would hoard. Now this is not mentioned in the Qur'an. And as I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful, He's so kind, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not out to expose people for their shortcomings. If there is, if there is ever a possible justification for bad behavior, Allah will conceal that shortcoming. Now, it seems that perhaps the reason why the Qur'an didn't mention this was because these people, the Israelites, they were living as slaves in Egypt. And when you are a slave, when you're a slave, you're not used to abundance. You are accustomed to scarcity. And perhaps they had this tendency to hoard because they were traumatized from the bondage that they experienced in Egypt. So maybe an excuse can be made for them that you know they have this tendency because of the trauma they experienced in Egypt. That's why they're hoarding. 
And therefore the Qur'an does not mention that. It doesn't criticize them for their hoarding. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticizes them for something else. They have been provided this food where they're receiving it directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ayah 61 is their reaction to the blessings of the food that Allah has provided for them. وَإِذْ قُلْتُمْ يَا مُوسَىٰ لَن نَصْبِرَ عَلَىٰ طَعَامٍ وَاحِدٍ They said to Musa, O oh Musa, we will never remain patient with one type of food. Every day we're eating quails. Every day it's the same food, same breakfast, same dinner. We want a different menu. It's the same thing every day. فَادْعُ لَنَا رَبَّكَ Make dua to your Lord. يُخْرِجْ لَنَا مِمَّا تُنْبِتُ الْأَرْضُ مِنْ بَقْلِهَا وَقِثَّائِهَا وَفُومِهَا وَعَدَسِهَا وَبَصَلِهَا They say to Musa, Musa, ask your Lord to make the earth produce some variety for us. Ask Allah to produce some greens, some cucumbers, right? Baqliha is greens. Pitha'iha, cucumbers. Wafumiha, some garlic. Wa'adasiha, some lentils. Wabasaliha, some onions. If it was you and I, some biryani, some kebab. At least they were mainly asking for vegetarian options. They wanted a variety. قال, what does Musa say to them? قال, أتستبدلو, Musa السلام, he says, are you trying to replace with something that is lower? Are you trying to replace something that is superior for something that is inferior? They were yearning for the food that they used to have in Egypt. So even though they were slaves, and they were living lives of humiliation, and they were subjugated by their Coptic masters, in their minds that at least we had some variety over there. At least we had some, uh, we had better food options. Musa alayhi salam, he says to them, اِهْبِطُوا مِصْرًا so, you know, before we go on here, notice how they speak to Musa. How many miracles have they witnessed from Musa a.s.? And they still do not call him Rasulullah. Notice that when the Israelites speak to Musa, they don't, they don't say, Ya Nabi Allah, Ya Rasulullah. They don't address him as a prophet of God or a messenger of God. They keep on calling him by his first name, Ya Musa. Meaning that they didn't really see him as a prophet. They didn't, they didn't offer him the respect and the reverence that he deserved. Ya Musa, len nasbir ala ta'amin wahid. They say that we will never, it's not that, you know, we're struggling a little bit, you know, give us some time to adjust. We will never be patient with one type of food. These are people who are impatient. A limited selection of food is unacceptable to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just saved you people from Fir'aun. You're fighting with Musa over food. So they weren't satisfied with the limitations of the food options. So Musa says, Are you trying to substitute that which is better for that which is inferior? Now, why does Musa السلام, say this to them? There's a, a discussion among the Mufassirin. Some have said the superiority of their, the food of men and salwa was because of its nutritional content. That yes, even though it was not a variety, 
It provided them with all of the vitamins and minerals that they needed to be healthy in a desert climate. This is the diet that you need in this environment. So Musa is saying that, are you trying to replace this optimal diet for something that is suboptimal? That's one view. Another opinion is that no, what Musa السلام, is saying is that this food is food that is being provided to you directly from Allah. You want to substitute something that comes directly from Allah with something that comes from the cultivation of human beings? There's more barakah. There are more blessings in things that come directly from Allah. Why are you trying to go to a, diff diff a different source? And then what does Musa say? He says, "Ihbitu Misran, fa'inna lakum masaltum." The word Misr can have multiple meanings. Musa says, "Go to Misr." Now, some scholars have said so. The word Misr can literally mean a city, meaning that we're out, we're in the middle of the desert. If you want variety of food, go to a nearby city. But it doesn't seem that this is the meaning here. Musa is basically saying to them, Ihbitu Misran, go down to Egypt. Ihbitu, it literally means go down. But not, it's not a literal descent here. Ihbitu means go down from a higher status with Allah to a lower status. What does this mean? This same verb, is found in the story of Adam When Adam was in the garden, he was receiving his food without any effort. In the garden, the food was there without him having to cultivate or to struggle to acquire his provisions. Allah, when he, after he eats from the tree, what does Allah say? to Adam and Eve, and Iblis. In verse 36 of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, اِهْبِطُوا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوا وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرٌ وَمَتَاعٌ إِلَى حِينٌ Allah says to Adam and Eve and Iblis, get down, go down. Meaning, O oh Adam, Go down from that world where I was providing food for you directly without you having to put any effort. Now go down to the earth and you have to struggle for your risk. The same concept here. Allah is, Musa is saying to them that if this is what you want, if you want to go back, if your obsession is with having a variety of food, go down. Go down to that old way of life where go back to Egypt and struggle and subject yourself to humiliation and go get your food there. Ihbitu Misran fa'inna lakum ma sa'altum. What's amazing here is that Bani Israel, and this is something that's mentioned in the Old Testament. And we mentioned this even yesterday. That they were yearning for the food that they used to eat in Egypt. They're asking Musa that we want the same type of food that we used to have in Egypt. This shows us, brothers and sisters, that... And many of them actually wanted to go back. And we will see this, inshallah, as we continue the story. One of the most negative qualities of Bani Israel in the Qur'an is that you see time and time again they are willing to compromise their dignity and their honor for worldly gain. Allah has provided you. Yes, the food options are more limited, but at least you're free. At least you're living a life of honor. You want to go back to Egypt. You want to go back to that state of slavery just so you can have better food? And this is where you see 
the emphasis within Islam on preserving your honor. They had no problem going back to Egypt. As long as they get, have good food, though you can humiliate them. They'll, they're willing to be slaves. Allah subha- Musa alayhi salam says, what is wrong with you people? You're willing to sacrifice your dignity and your honor just to have more food options? You should be more covetous about your honor and your dignity. And this is where we have a beautiful narration from Imam al-Askari salawatullahi alayhi. He says, ما أقبح بالمؤمن أن تكون له رغبة تذله Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, he says, how abhorrent it is for a person to have a desire that humiliates them. Have desires. Satisfy your desires. But don't allow your desires to put you in a position that humiliates yourself. There's a beautiful hadith from Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ فَوَّضَ لِلْمُؤْمِنِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Allah has given authority to a believer to do as he wants with his life, within the parameters of the sharia. Allah is not going to dictate to you what you should do at every moment. Allah has given you the freedom to live as you see fit. But there is one thing that Allah has not given you the right to do. And that is the right to humiliate yourself. Allah doesn't allow you to humiliate yourself. You are never allowed to compromise your dignity and your honor. And this is where we have the famous line of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, where he says, Hey hat, Allahumma salli ala One of the reasons why Imam al Hussein alayhi salam refused to give bay'ah to Yazid was, was a matter of honor. Someone like me cannot give allegiance to someone like you. Notice Imam al Hussein doesn't say Hussein will not give allegiance to Yazid. It's not personal. It's about honor. It's about dignity. Imam al Hussein says, Hey, hat min nadhilla. Imam al Hussein is willing to put his life in danger to preserve honor, to preserve his dignity. And this is why Imam al Hussein salam, in another statement he says, he says, الْمَوْتُ أَوْلَى مِنْ رُكُوبِ الْعَارِ That death is easier than living in humiliation. Imam says, death is easier. You contrast that with Bani Israel. They're willing to leave Musa. They're willing to walk away from this ni'mah that Allah gave them. And to go back to their former slaves. Just so they can eat some food just so they can have a little bit more comfort. And this is a lesson for us, brothers and sisters. We can't just live anywhere. We have to live, we, we choose places to live based on our ability to practice our faith. Yes, there might be some parts of the world that are more convenient for you to live. The housing is better, the food is better, the weather is better. But you are putting yourself in an environment where you cannot practice your faith. You're expect, accepting humiliation. You're willing to sacrifice your honor, which is your deen, for some material gain. What's the difference between us and Bani Israel? So Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he says, Al mawtu awla min rukub al ani. And then he says, وَالْعَارُ أَوْلَى مِنْ دُخُولِ النَّارِ And hum- humiliation is better than entering Jahannam. So if you ever have a choice bet- between death and humiliation, Imam says death is easier than humiliation. But if you ever have a choice between humiliation and Jahannam, it's better to select humiliation than enter Jahannam. Now when it comes to this concept of shuk, 
Because ultimately this was the crime of Bani Israel. Instead of being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they had what? Greed. They wanted more. It wasn't enough for them. They lacked contentment. How many of us we lack contentment? You know, when you read the story of Bani Israel, we think that this is just a story about the past. They could not be patient with one type of food. You and I are similar, but we're similar with other things. We're not satisfied with, you know, one pair of shoes. We need 50 of them. We're not satisfied with one luxury car. We want another one. They lack contentment. And some of us, we also lack contentment. Now, no one is saying that you should enjoy, enjoy your life. But if your sustenance is limited, don't go into massive amounts of debt just to keep up with the Joneses. Don't tell yourself that I have to get this thing to be happy. Live within your means and be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because your purpose in life is not to, to accumulate wealth. That's not the goal. If Allah blesses you with wealth, use that wealth as an opportunity to seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Contentment. And this is what Bani Israel lacked. Now, when it comes to gratitude, there are four main benefits to gratitude that we find in the Qur'an and the Ahadith. Because ultimately, one of the things that led to the damnation of Bani Israel was their lack of gratitude. You know, you notice, not one of them ever turned to Musa and said, Musa, thank you for rescuing us from Fir'aun. If you're not grateful to people, you're not grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same Musa who went up against Fir'aun, who defended them, who protected them, not one time did they say thank you to Musa. And after Allah provides them with all of these blessings and these bounties, there's no gratitude. The only thing that they say is that it's not enough. It's not enough. We want more. Not an ounce of gratitude. When it comes to shuk, Imam Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi says, He says, ما أنعم الله على عبد من نعمة فعرفها بقلبه وحمد الله ظاهرا بلسانه فتم كلامه حتى يؤمر له بالزيادة Imam al-Sadiq he says that when Allah bestows a blessing on a person and they recognize that blessing with their heart because this is, this is the reality of gratitude to simply know that what you have been given is from Allah it's not from your intelligence. There are many people who are more intelligent, who are more capable than you, and they are deprived of many things that Allah has given you. Recognize that this is from Allah, whether it's your physical beauty, whether it's your intelligence, your wealth, your children, it's all from Allah. Imam al-Sadiq says, there is not... Allah salli ala Muhammad. Whenever Allah bestows a blessing upon a person and they recognize that blessing with their heart and they express gratitude to Allah with their tongue, Imam says, as soon as they finish thanking Allah with their tongue, Allah has decreed ziyada for them. Allah has guaranteed an increase. Now you may wonder that Sometimes I feel gratitude in my heart and I express gratitude with my tongue, but I don't see that increase that the Quran is promising. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does He promise in the Quran? If you are grateful, I will increase you. But Allah doesn't mention what, what He will increase you with. Sometimes Allah will increase the same ni'mah that He gave you. 
Allah granted you children, you, ask, you do shukr, Allah will grant you more. That's one way of ziyadah. But sometimes Allah increases you in a different way. He might not increase you in the material blessing, but He increases you in iman. He increases you in your spirituality. He increases you in your taqwa. He increases you in your insight. He increases you in that inner peace. There is an increase. But what type of increase? It might be a spiritual increase. But the point is there is some type of increase. This is number one. Number two, in another narration from Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi, He says, مَا مِنْ عَبْدٍ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ نِعْمَةً فَعَرَفَ أَنَّهَا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ There is not a single person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them a blessing and they recognize that it is from Allah. See, this is the essence of shukr, to recognize that this is all from Allah. The Imam says, إِلَّا غَفَرَ اللَّهُ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَحْمِدًا Imam al-Sadiq says, as soon as you recognize with your heart that this ni'mah is from Allah, Allah immediately forgives you for your sins even before you say Alhamdulillah. Just the recognition of the heart, this has value. Just the recognition of the heart that this blessing is from Allah. Number three, so shukr increases it's a means of increasing our blessings, whether material or spiritual. It's a means of earning the forgiveness of Allah. Number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispels many punishments and calamities because of shukr. Allah says in Surah An-Nisa, verse 147, مَا in shakartum. Allah says, what does Allah have to do with your punishment if you are grateful? Meaning, being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wards away many punishments that you and I are deserving of in this life. Just that gratitude may save you from so many misfortunes that would have struck you if you were not grateful. That gratitude is a source of protection for us. And then, finally, my dear brothers and sisters, shukr benefits our souls. It benefits our souls. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Naml, He says, وَمَنْ شَكَرَ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ Whoever is grateful, you are grateful to the benefit of your own nafs. Your nafs benefits from it. And then, I'll end with this. Imam al-Hadi, he has a beautiful hadith. He says, أَشَّاكِرُ أَسْعَدُ بِالشُّكْرِ مِنْهُ بِالنِّعْمَةِ That a person who is grateful is more prosperous because of his gratitude than the blessing. Meaning, you benefit more from your gratitude than from receiving the actual blessing. Why? He says, أَشَّاكِرُ أَسْعَدُ بِالشُّكْرِ مِنْهُ بِالنِّعْمَةِ الَّتِي أَوْجَبَتِ الشُّكْرِ لِأَنَّ النِّعَمْ مَتَاعْ وَالشُّكْرُ نِعَمٌ وَعُقْبَى When Allah gives you a blessing, especially material blessings, those blessings, they benefit your physical body. They benefit your dunya. But the dunya perishes. Your body perishes. Those blessings that you are grateful to Allah for, those blessings are finite. They are enjoyed for a period and then they perish. But gratitude is an act of the nafs. And whatever the nafs does, it remains with it until after death. And therefore, shukr is something that benefits us even after the ni'mah itself is gone. Because you have adorned your soul 
with a quality that will benefit it greatly in its journey after death. Inshallah, tomorrow night we'll continue our discussion. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين. Oh.